Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so passive digital preservation. It, it's a kind of follow-up of the previous presentation, so that's very good. Um, so uh, we worked in the context of uh, radioactive waste management with ANDRA, which is the French National Radioactive Waste Management Agency. And um, in this sector, as it was slightly mentioned, we look at very long term, very long time scales, uh, ranging from typically at least 300 years to uh, close to a million years, actually. So that's very, very long term. Um, so Andra um, historically used paper as uh, a long-term medium, but basically to uh, print <coughs> uh, analog documents in plain French. And so this uh, this is a problem for uh, uh, for born digital documents, uh, typically databases, uh, which are not suitable to be printed analog in analog form. Um, on our side, I represent you here, uh, we developed a self-contained software and paper solution. So we are able to, um, to um, put software on something like paper uh, to, proce to, to process data. So th this extends the applicability of, uh, of permanent paper to digital content. Oh, by the way, permanent paper is a kind of specific paper which can last typically um, for 500 years around that long. So that's very long, quite long-term uh, media. Um, it's the missing link for fully passive digital preservation. So basically, permanent paper is passive preservation, but that's analog preservation. So what we, we do is to uh, extend it for digital content. The solution was independently tested in France by the French Space Agency, um, a research center in uh, the south of France, and ultimately by ANDRA themselves. By independently, I mean that um, the, uh, well, this actually, a document on paper, was handed to them without any further explanation, and someone internally from this document was able to recover the data that is uh, stored on paper. So the solution is called MicroLanis. It's file storage on paper. So we store a binary, basically a binary file on, uh, in the form of two-dimensional barcodes, more or less the same as QR codes. We call them emblems. One file can fit into one or more uh, emblems, typically. Uh, it has nowadays built-in compression similar to 7-zip, let's say, which is fully transparent for uh, both the, uh, at archive time and for the user in the long term. He doesn't even know it's compressed. It has built in also error uh, correction and detection. It's uh, compatible with very standard 600 DPI printers and scanners. Of course, it relies over the long term on 600 DPI scanners, so we should have this in hundreds of years, so hopefully we will. Uh, it operates by a self-contained software process, which is fully independent from any specific technology. I will further develop uh, on the next slide. And currently, it's suited for v very simple file formats, such as text, uh, uncompressed images such as BMP and uh, WAV files, for instance, for audio. So you can put audio on paper. <laughs> so at the core of Micronis is a virtual machine actually called Olanis, which relies on a very simple algorithm which is suitable for any programmer, even a programmer that has started programming for a year, let's say, a student is able to uh, to port, to implement the, the algorithm into any, any language like Python, C Sharp, C++, whatever. Even JavaScript, actually. It's described over, over two pages only and is very, to, yeah, as I said, to implement uh, with any language. So the set of, of, uh, of necessary elements is described in a, what we call a primer. It spans a dozen pages and 
20 pages if it's bilingual. Uh, currently, it, it's uh, both it's French and English. UK and US, by the way. <laughs> so an emblem looks like this, slightly zoomed. Otherwise, you are far, but it looks more like grayscale because it's very thin. So at Andra, it was uh, tested uh, mostly over two, 2020 and 20 and 21 with two uh, steps. The first, so both steps uh, involved a, a database of all the individual pa uh, waste packages that are stored at the oldest French radio radioactive waste repository, which is in the very north of France, which is the, a closed uh, site, so there are no more waste packages that go into this site. So basically the database itself is complete and will not change. At first, uh, Andra extracted a subset of, of about 4,000 lines, which correspond to 4,000 waste packages. And uh, a year later, we uh, tested on, on the complete database of about 1.5 million lines. So for the first test, uh, basically, I handled that kind of document on 15 pages in French to uh, a computer engineer and uh, a second, second year co op student. As I said, it's someone who was not very strong capabilities in programming. Um, and they had absolutely no prior knowledge of what it was all about. So um, it took them two weeks with a number of trial and errors to actually recover the, uh, the original digital file as a file and to process it in some way. The second test so was on, on the full database. Um, for this, we converted the, the main uh, table as a CSV file, so it was plain text. There was quite a lot of redundancy. Um, so the, the original file, which was 600, uh, over 600 megabytes, was reduced to 23 megabytes using the built-in compression I talked about earlier. And so it translated into 444 pages, which is fairly reasonable. I think. Um, when we added the 20 pages of the primer, it's, it's 464 pages of a single document. And Andra historically had evaluated that printing that same information in analog form, they had seriously considered that, um, would have translated in about 1 million pages. So that's huge. It's a factor of about 2,000. Um, also browsing through one million pages of numbers <laughs> would have been challenging. Whereas with this solution, they can actually retrieve the original error-corrected uh, digital information, which can be processed automatically. So uh, we together scanned those 444 pages uh, with a bitonal 600 dpi standard scanner and we had 17 pages in error. It was just a matter of rescanning those 17 pages to, um, to get a, a completely error-free uh, file back. That's just a final uh, picture that represents a part of an emblem which is squeezed in this case when we scanned it. You know, the, mechanically the, the scanner can have, the, the speed can vary slightly and sometimes squeezed just to show that this is not really a problem, it will be corrected by this built-in software and works anyway. So that's it for my presentation. I hope you have some questions. Um, I'd like to add that uh, I can provide a full uh, demonstration of the whole solution to anyone who's interested. So after the presentation or any time today, please come to me and I can demonstrate it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent, for presenting on a quite an unusual case study compared to some of the other things um, at this conference, so thank you. Uh, I'm sure there's questions for Vincent on that particular case study. Yeah, over here.
you, you're v- a very interesting presentation. I, I'm, I'm fascinated. Thank you. The thing that, that struck me whilst you were talking was the volume of the resulting material. You have, what was it, a 600-megabyte file. Um, in olden days, that was half a floppy disk. Um, um, sorry, um, no. half, half a... Well, it was small. It, it's a CD-ROM. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, f- but these 464 pages yeah. is considerably larger than... than than a CD-ROM. So, where do you put this stuff? And how do you catalog it and make sure you can get back to it and find exactly what you want? And, and how, how soon will you run out of, of usable, practical space? Well, at Andra, the, the process, uh, as, as normal business, they process paper documents. So they have an archive, a, a paper archive, where they have documents indexed, cataloged, etc. So basically what we produce is another paper document which will be indexed and processed in, in exactly the same way. Um, the difference in volume compared to CD-ROM, of course it's bigger, but the problem is that no CD-ROM will last that long. And you cannot read it back in 100 years. So that's the main problem. Here you can. So um, you should really compare what's comparable, which is the analog document to this document and not this to uh, the latest hard drive or anything, of, obviously. Does that answer your question? Sort of. I, I wasn't trying to compare um, the storage medium currently. I'm, I'm thinking about long term. Yeah. I, I, for each CD-ROM you, you convert, you're ending up with 465 pages or more. Very rapidly, you're going to use up a lot of space. Yeah. And, and that. But much less than in analog. And yeah. this could be uh, applicable to very specific documents, not everything. So, yeah, it's not a one-size-fits-all as well. <laughs> Pun intended, I expect. Here we are talking about very important data. It's a database that relates to a big site in the north of France, so it, it's not re- really big compared to the site itself or any, any package, by the way. Sorry. Oh. We've got two more questions. We'll, we'll take both of them. Go hello, ahead. Hello. Are you keeping documentation on how to make the scanner again if you don't have the scanner in 100 well, years? Well, that's actually a very good question. Um, indeed, on top of this very small document, I think it would be important to document what is a computer, what is a scanner, as you say, possibly how to rebuild one. Um, this is more common knowledge. So you could also expect that in libraries you will find okay. documents that talk about this, that, that you know, technical documents, uh, anything like that, to, which will allow future users to rebuild a computer, a scanner, because this is widespread technology nowadays. But you're right, ideally it should be appended to, um, to the document and it could be very thick <laughs> to rebuild a, a scanner, a computer, but yeah. Speakers will be doing really well for time, no pressure, guys. Uh, so we've still got, I think, time for questions here. So I think Susan at the back had a question, back row, sorry. <laughs> and when you're asking a question, could you just uh, say your name and where you're from for the oh, online audience, please? Hi, Susan Currigal from the National Records of Scotland. Um, thank you very much too, I thoroughly in- enjoyed that. I wanted to ask you a question about, I think if I heard you correctly, the, the agency still uses paper routinely in its day-to-day business. And I wanted to ask you about that paper and how how that paper is retained. Is it retained after your barcode scanning process? Um, redeem, um, I'm, I don't know about the word redeem, is it destroyed or, sorry? In, re- kept. Kept. Yeah, yeah well, it's n- non-destructive, of course, so um, yeah, it can be scanned at various times. Ideally, it should be scanned at regular intervals over time to ensure that the knowledge remains cu- sufficiently current. So the same document should be 
one, one of these documents should be extracted, let's say, every five years, for instance. And recovery should be attempted again by someone who doesn't know anything about it. Uh, and it can be, of course, put back to storage for uh, until f for, for fa 500 years, actually. Is that, does that say? Okay, thank you. Sounds good. We have a question from online. There are a couple of questions from online, so if we don't get to them all, we'll, we can hopefully get back to them in the discussion at the end. So the first one is, did the student make any notes on how they went about reconstructing the data from the paper version? What kind of things did they try? What information did they look up to help? So what was their process? Yeah, um, they did take a lot of notes. Um, actually, they struggled over um, what I considered um, unimportant things in the document, which turned out to be important. And it was not the only case. It's always the case. I, I submitted to, to a number of people, and each time they had different problems. And that's interesting because sometimes we have to change one, one sentence to make it much clearer for the user not to spend three days <laughs> uh, struggling with, with, a, with something which, sa which sounds um, uh, not so important. So yeah, we, we, we spent uh, a couple of hours. I spent uh, that time with them to get their feedback and they told me how they got into the document, what, what were the problems, what they did not understand, etc. Et to, to make slight modifications to the document to make it better. <laughs> Great, thank you. Go work. Go I'll squeeze this one in quickly. Uh, this process seems seemed to be quite similar to what Pickle, the Norwegian company using films for digital to analog preservation, is doing. What, di uh, did you talk to Pickle? How different are both processes, the Andra and the Pickle one? Yeah, of course, I, I discussed with Pickle a few years back. Um, currently, as far as I know, they don't have the equivalent of the primer. So what they... Um, what they, they, they do is to uh, print out all the documentation about, for instance, the C language. So that's huge. Um, and and th their software relies on the C language, which is something very complex. So that's, uh, it's a very good question because actually the problem is that when, you when your software relies on such complex environment, um, basically it will not work in the same way in 500 years. Uh, there will be small changes in the implementation which will break the software and the problem is that obviously you don't have access to, to the original developers and so it could be extremely difficult to make the thing work and basically people could just um, quit trying to, to make it work and that's the problem. The main thing that, that drove the, the, the redaction of this uh, the writing of this um, primer is to have steps that are progressive and simple enough for someone in the very long term not to be stuck for too long. Thank you. We need thank to you. move on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you've earned a rest, I think. So thank you very much, Vincent. Thank you.